go ahead and get started. If we could start recording. And I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Darren McAvoy. I work with the Utah Forest Landowner Education Program here at Utah State University Forestry Extension. Um, I'd like to also introduce our co-hosts today. Uh, Olivia Salmon is operating from upstairs in the building I'm in, the BNR building, Biology and Natural Resources building here on the campus of Utah State University. And um, Mike Kuntz is co-hosting um, both. Uh, and Mike has voice uh, capabilities to answer questions as well. And Mike is operating out of Seattle while he's on sabbatical there. Um, like to point out some parts of our screen. We've got the main screen with the presentation on it, and then uh, uh, off to the left, we call these little boxes on their pods, or this uh, uh, Adobe Connect software likes to call them pods. On top is a pod with just a still photograph of myself. We decided to use still photographs rather than live webcams to save bandwidth and to reduce distraction. Um, below that we have a, an attendee list, a shorty, short attendee list today, but sure are glad both Brian and Ron could make it. Thank you. And below that notice the chat pod um, and anybody can add uh, questions or comments there. Feel free to do that and I'll try to, Mike and I will try to answer your questions as they come up um, orally and uh, don't be afraid to use that. You can type whatever you like in the bottom and you can choose to send it to a single person or to a group of people or everybody. Welcome Dale. Glad you could make it back for part two of the planting a timber harvest. Today I was just introducing folks. Introduce Mike and Olivia. Um, Brian Welton uh, is a LDS forester out of Salt Lake City. Um, Dale is a district ranger on the, I believe, Cedar City District. Welcome, Dale. And Ron is also a, Ron Daniels is a water professional out of Salt Lake City with the, oh, I know I'll goof up the proper name, Ron, apologize, but I think it's the Governor's um, Water Resource Board. It's my best shot at it. Sorry for any mistakes there. Um, and I really encourage you to, uh, everybody to chat at will and interact. Um, I guess I just introduced everybody, took that liberty. Um, I'd like you gentlemen, please, if, if you would, um, either enter your email in the chat pod so we have it for future uh, notices we can send to you when we're doing um, uh, webcasts in the future, but more importantly, directly, we'd like to send you an evaluation after the webcast today. And you can either enter it in the ch enter your email in the chat pod if you'd like to share it with everybody, or um, if you prefer, uh, after the webcast, you can go to the URL I put up on the screen there at the bottom to uh, register uh, uh, on our database, uh, again, to be included in information uh, about future webcasts. We're trying to do these monthly or every other month, and uh, I've got a couple of interested uh, presenters lined up for uh, this summer. We haven't committed any dates, but uh, John Shaw from the Forest In Inventory and Analysis Group uh, and I have sp spoken, and he's agreed to present for us sometime this summer on uh, what he sees in trends in uh, forest health across Utah. And uh, Barbara Bentz with the Rocky Mountain Research Station has agreed to uh, present on uh, bark beetles in Utah. So hopefully those will be informative and interesting. Um, check my check my little cheat sheet here. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, a poll, um, which I might be able to answer pretty well for everybody, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you to go ahead and fill that in. Um, I would, uh, yeah, if you have a chance, 
go ahead and enter your answers there if you have administered timber sales or if you have any experience with them. I use this to help guide my talk a little bit and see see how how in depth I should get with certain parts. Well I lost track of that pole. There it is. And it seems like everybody, most folks have, I know both Brian and Dale have administered timber sales on there on, on other properties. And uh, thank you for your participation there. I'm going to go ahead and close that up. Move it out of the way. and continue with our program. Thanks again for uh, coming today. Today is uh, part two uh, in uh, planning a timber harvest. I presented part one a month ago um, and it is archived and available on our website as are all of our webcasts. This one will be of course uh, at the end of the day. Well we probably won't have it up till tomorrow but uh, um, that's the plan to uh, go ahead and archive each of these and make them available as, as we produce them. And, and I covered about half of the material in the first one and today we're going to jump into the second half. Um, I'll quickly run through a similar introduction as last time. Oh, welcome Morgan. Thank you for attending today. Um, notice the chat pod down in the bottom left corner. Feel free to uh, ask questions or point things out there, um, uh, but I'll get going. Um, just wanted to again start with uh, pointing out what we're what we're shooting for, uh, what the target is, uh, uh, an end result of of a forest of beautiful leaf trees that are not scarred up or beat up, and high quality leaf trees with good clean, uh, usually single tops and some of the best growing trees and the best seed source trees uh, on the property. Um, and it's not incredibly hard to do when you're starting with a nice forest to end up with a nice forest in the timber cell process. That's the whole goal. It's, that's what's most important, what we, what we finish up with. Um, uh, what we're looking for, again, is undamaged trees. These trees have been marked by a forester up on the school, the Daniel Forest, or experimental forest associated with Utah State University. Um, and uh, these are the leave trees. They were marked to leave. Trees can be marked to leave or to cut. It just depends how you line it out and put it in your contract. But um, um, important to uh, have a forester mark your timber uh, ideally before you before you have it harvested. It costs considerably more but the results are usually far far better. Uh, sort of a captured picture of what to avoid all in one spot. Uh, the background uh, forest had you know they left some green on the hillside but it tended to be the worst trees that were available and they took the best trees that were available. Um, this uh, timber sale happened several years before this photo and these old slash piles in the foreground have not been burned or taken care of leaving uh, kind of an eyesore on the property. Um, noxious weeds to the left of the photo and uh, chemicals, uh, petroleum products left on the site uh, for long after the, the sale. Uh, looking to avoid these sorts of things in, in timber sale on your property or one that you admin, administer. Uh, a high graded stand is one where the best trees have been taken um, and the stand has definitely been high graded. Again, they left something green on the hillside but uh, this is your seed source for future generations so leave lousy trees now and you'll have lousy trees in the future. future. Uh, another name for high grading is taking the best and leaving the rest. Um, notice this tree on the right, uh, very scarred up, 
cambium all exposed a tree like that won't ever really have much growth potential again usually recommend taking those out unless they have some other special um, significance to a landowner and in that case they should have been more carefully protected in the first place I try to remove most trees uh, that have scars very much bigger than than my hand ideally if, if I got a good logger working with me that, that's being careful and and leaving some usually they'll leave a couple of trees smaller trees undesirable trees around a desirable tree uh, to pivot the logs off of as they're pulling them out to protect that tree and then uh, then go zip them off with a saw at the end of the sale to clean things up that's the kind of process that we're looking for and it's not hard to find uh, examples around Utah of um, poorly administered and set up uh, timber sales and I'll use this the terms timber harvest and timber sale interchangeably throughout the program this landowner went away for a weekend and came back and loggers had torn skid trails all across his property up above Fairview and he was pretty upset about it but didn't really have any means to, to, to deal with it in the contract or the lack of contract that he had with with the fort with the logger and a similar story uh, this road was not expected by the landowner and uh, no um, uh, no water drainage was provided for uh, as they built the road which is kind of the first rule of road building is provide drainage as you go up so if we get the kind of storms we've had in the last few weeks it won't blow the road out and put a bunch of silt in the creek uh, trying to avoid that sort of thing again we can do it well um, lots of plenty of examples of, of highly desirable uh, results in timber sales around Utah Um, in the first part of the process, the first part of our webcast uh, a month ago, I covered the first five points here. Uh, considering objectives, consulting with a professional forester, that one I consider the most important of them all perhaps. Um, because a professional forester c should walk you through all of these others. Um, Number three, defining appropriate silviculture practices. We talked about identifying timber sale boundaries and developing harvest and harvest plans um, during our last webcast, which again is archived on our website. And uh, today I'd like to cover developing uh, a timber sale contract, uh, choosing a logger, marketing your timber, administering the harvest, and completing the post-harvest administration activities. We'll jump into the timber sale contract. There's several main points in a timber sale contract and they can be written in such a way that they're almost impossible to understand. You need a whole team of lawyers to really get a handle on them. Um, but they can be written just as poorly or even more poorly the other direction I think where it's just one page and not much is said and there's very little in there to protect the landowner from from uh, uh, liability and the responsibility of having people doing very dangerous work on your property. A chance of people, someone getting hurt or um, even killed is, is certainly there and, and you need to protect yourself um, as a landowner during that, that process and that's the portion of the contract that we get into uh, these sorts of things. Um, you got to talk about the, the type of timber sale that it is. Is it a clear cut or a selective harvest? You know, what trees are they taking? What trees are they leaving? It needs to all be clearly lined out. Um, the, the terms of the contract and, and the dates. Um, you want to give them a reasonable amount of time to to do the work on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, you don't want them. You, you don't want it just open ended so that they can log in there for years and years, unless that is your intent as a landowner. So having these things clearly lined out in a proper timber sale contract is incredibly important um, for 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 protecting yourself and for just for clear communication between you and your logger and your forester. Often there's a couple of different contracts in place when you have a consulting forester. There's usually a 
direct contract between you and them that uh, outlines their fiduciary responsibilities to you. It's their job to look out for your best interest. That's uh, another one of many good reasons to hire a, a forester in the timber sale process. But then there's um, also a direct contract between you, the landowner, and the logger that points out the forester and, and their responsibility. But the the real meat of it is uh, of the transaction certainly is between the logger and um, the la the landowner, and that's the kind of contract I'm talking about here, the timber sale contract. You have to have terms of payment is another item, very important into it. You're getting paid by the thousand board feet. You're getting paid by the ton. Where is it getting weighed? Um, if it is by the ton, who scales? Um, perhaps how long it can sit on a landing and dry out and, and lose value back at the mill, back at the scales. Um, I've seen some sales here in Utah where, oh man, just uh, not hundreds but dozens and dozens of truckloads of wood just sitting on the landings for months at a time all summer um, would, in what appears to be an attempt to dry out the wood before it's paid for. That's the kind of thing we want to line out in a timber sale process in, in a contract. Um, and utilization standards. Most of these will be uh, directed by the sawmill that you're sending the logs to. Uh, and some mills have different specs than other mills. But um, it needs to be written out clearly so that uh, logs are not left and value is not left on the property where it's not in intended to be. Um, finally, bond requirements. Very important if uh, the, the logger does damage to your property or walks off uh, the job uh, incomplete, leaves a lot of slash piles on Pile or unpiled or unburned or um, just a bunch of falls a bunch of, bunch of trees and walks away and doesn't skid them and you're left with uh, a liability on the property because of different insect and disease issues and you'll need to get that wood out of there uh, directly and so situations like this can help you can help to avoid these sorts of situations by having bond requirements and uh, but on the other hand we have to be we have to be somewhat giving. It has to be give and take with loggers, especially you know, it's a limited uh, resource pool of, of that kind of professional we have here in Utah, and uh, many cannot um, could not put up the kind of bonds that a logger that that does a bigger business in in, in the Northwest, for for example, might be able to do. So uh, to some extent we have to tailor our expectations to what is available in in uh, what expertise is available to you as a landowner um, within the timber sale contract we recommend that you put in whose responsibility it is to notify um, and uh, the the state the division of forestry fire and state lands about the process um, and uh, to uh, acquire all necessary permits because ultimately the way it's set up is that it's the landowner's responsibility to do this um, uh, the way it's written into uh, the notification of intent to log um, uh, documents um, so it needs to be clearly laid out between the logger and the landowner exactly who's going to do that and, and when and, and such um, end of sale requirements, how they're going to button it up, are they going to do what? This is a picture photograph of a water bar uh, in a skid trail, a, a humped um, piece of ground that will help reduce soil erosion um, and um, it will, and it's just one of the many things that we do when we close out a timber sale, we might uh, go ahead and, and uh, seed many of these skid trails afterwards. Um, so even things like what goes into the seed mixture uh, can be written right into the timber sale contract. Um, I see we have several new uh, attendees. Uh, welcome everybody. I encourage you to introduce yourselves uh, if you have a chance using the chat pod in the bottom left corner of your screen and, uh, and uh, present that to folks. Uh, a few of the names I don't know and welcome like glad to have you I'll encourage you also to register um, at the end of the program um, uh, with us if you can or 
simply if you'd like to share your email with everybody if you don't mind sort of broadcasting it there in the chat pod you could just enter it there we'd like to send out an evaluation after today's program find out uh, what people thought about it and how we can make it better in the future but uh, thanks everybody for coming encourage you to type uh, any comments or questions that you have along the way um, we have prepared a uh, document a, one of our series of Utah Forest facts um, on simply preparing a timber sale contract excuse me um, and this is available on our website um, and I like the way one of the neat things about this it's somewhat of an interactive fact sheet because we put it together in a PDF format available to you on our website so that uh, you can go through it and more easily pick out pick it apart by pieces and tailor the contract your own contract to your own needs and I would always encourage folks to have an attorney, their attorney, look over a timber sale contract before you sign it, any any contract to the logger. For many folks, a timber sale will be uh, perhaps one of, if not the biggest, financial transaction they go through in their entire lives. And so it's kind of silly to go, go into something like that without a contract. We wouldn't buy a house without a contract. And... Um, anything that large and uh, timber sales can certainly be that large in, in financial financial terms uh, choosing a logger most important thing is to have loggers with experiences uh, with with a high amount of experience like these two guys these are the Blazard brothers from up around Camus Jim and John um, um, I think within their family they've got hundreds and hundreds of years of logging in, in their in that Camus area and uh, and that's really important to have somebody who knows the land can be incredibly helpful at least somebody who is experienced with an experienced logger and a real professional not somebody who is just doing it uh, kind of on the side sometimes we need to do it find somebody who's doing it on the side here in Utah especially we have smaller sales uh, you know a little five acre ten acre sort of timber sale it, often it's done that way and often with good results when all these other um, points are taken into mind but um, absolutely ask them for references and ask around for other references not just the ones that they provide to you um, uh, ask figure out who they've logged for and see if they're happy and go look at the work that they've done you know and that can be deceiving that process because um, kind of harping on this continually but a logger on one sale on one side of the valley where a forester was involved in looking out for the landowner and uh, and holding uh, their feet to the fire so to speak you could have a very different result than perhaps on the other side of the valley where they were working without a forester involved and no landowner oversight um, not saying these these uh, gentlemen on the screen would do anything like that uh, the blazards I, I have a lot of uh, faith in but any logger I would choose I would want to have a forester involved again to look out for the best interest of the landowner because it's a business process and they want to do a good job for you but um, you know their bottom line is affected by by the job that they do and if uh, a forester is um, holding them to the specific points of a contract and, and good forestry the result tends to be better um, and you want of course their proof of insurance um, that is a document that is provided by their insurance company right when the timber sale starts and perhaps um, and often you can set up with the insurance companies to uh, let you know if they cancel their insurance during the timber sale process which is an old trick by uh, less reputable loggers again no reference to the blazards here on the screen um, within the contract it's, it's appropriate to uh, indicate what what the right logging equipment is this is a Timco Feller Buncher excellent piece of logging machinery can do great work um, and quickly and protect leaf trees and actually 
go a good way towards protecting soil but it's not always the right piece of equipment if uh, you have 70 percent slopes on your property it's going to be too much for a piece of equipment like this and might need to be helicopter logged and if that's the case that needs to be written right into the contract um, a common problem as far as equipment goes is just it, it can be oversized this is a great cat for building road um, really appropriate for that but lousy for sneaking uh, logs between trees just much too large it'll beat everything up it's not the kind of equipment that you want logging on your property here in Utah we don't have timber big enough to warrant a cat of this size um, really important part of the process and choosing a logger not only looking at all the things I've mentioned what kind of equipment they have you know maybe you want a horse logger instead of a, a cat logger depending on your own uh, needs and concerns on your property um, but um, a site tour is a very important part of the process for choosing a logger just going out and inviting uh, three or four different loggers out to your property and uh, having a walk around or a drive around if you have good road access and looking at the trees that have been marked or not marked or whatever and, and talking about what you want done and give them a feel for what your timber looks like and, and the lay of the land and, and uh, it gives you a chance to get a feel for, for their professionalism and, and uh, start to build uh, some sort of a trust relationship between the logger and, and the landowner. Good idea to have a forester involved in these site tours as well. Um, marketing your timber, next part of the process. Um, often in Utah the timber marketing is done uh, by the logger themselves or by a timber broker that's an individual who's not really a forester but um, usually has a lot of ideally has a lot of logging experience and uh, is a go-between uh, the sawmill and the logger and will help oversee things for a, a landowner and, and market the timber as part of their process and then they can um, bunch up a couple of different landowners and present a bigger larger package more attractive package to the sawmill uh, theoretically being bringing better prices back to the landowner um, and um, asking around for prices is an important part of it if your neighbors have have done a timber sale um, ask them what they've got uh, for their wood you know did they get paid by the ton did they get paid by the um, uh, by the, the thousand board feet or some other payment did they just trade for services on their property for road building or, or uh, cabin preparation or something like that um, uh, just asking around other loggers uh, other foresters it's a good way to start to get a feel for prices um, we have a crest good question from Brian uh, thank you Brian and any thoughts on the recovery of the sawmill infrastructure that has gone away here in Utah um, uh, difficult topic for sure we have lost a huge amount of sawmill infrastructure There's a lot of mills that have closed very limited choices for landowners and and uh, when there's fewer timber sales going on uh, in the state that tends to hurt um, landowners because there's not as many sawmills competing for their logs um, so um, we've lost as I say a tremendous amount of not only sawmills in the state so you have fewer choices but um, a, a lot of the loggers are all high quality loggers have are off driving coal trucks or something where they could get steady income because it was so spotty here oh the only thing I could say is Oh, it, it somewhat depends on the federal agencies um, make giving providing a steady supply of timber from their properties um, so that we uh, have a business it's really hard to have a business with the ups and downs so much as they have been and I don't want to be pointing fingers I know it's been very difficult for federal agencies to to do that sort of thing with environmental concerns over these last uh, decade this last decade or two um, we're taking trying to take steps or I'm involved in a coordinated resource offering protocol um, thing that's crop we call it um, you can see uh, information about that on our website that uh, um, that uh, 
hopefully will help to levelize that supply and and deal with that issue to, to some extent. And as you point out, Brian, there in the chat pod, that uh, transpor transportation costs make many sales uh, diseconomic. Um, yeah, the distance to sawmills, I've I, I've always been amazed since I've gotten to Utah that we can send logs to Montana and Washington and Oregon and Colorado and, and still be able to pay landowners anything for them, but, but that's the way it's been because of the lack of infrastructure here in Utah. But that is often a, a limiting factor how the distance you are from the mill. If you're 20 or 30 miles down the road from an active sawmill, then you've got a, you've got a great benefit uh, advantage over most landowners. Uh, before I jump into the administering the harvest portion, um, I'm going to uh, introduce another another poll. I'd like you to uh, please uh, take a moment to uh, express your interest um, as as uh, if you're landowners or loggers or foresters. It helps us to tailor our um, programs in the future mostly and, and even within this one uh, as to what I'm talking about in the process. Um, uh, we've got four out of nine uh, participating. I encourage everybody to take a minute. And while I'm speaking about that, um, you could refer to Brian's chat. Uh, sawmills uh, could be built if there was a sustained yield off the the, the federal landowners. Um, I absolutely agree with Brian's point. That's the main thing that we're lacking in Utah as far as being able to support a reasonable sawmill in industry here in the state. Um, I know several loggers who have been continue to struggle with it. Sawmill owners struggle with it every year and it's, it's really touch and go for them every year. You know, our best, our, what's left of our biggest sawmills that may, you know, in a good year hire 30 to 70 people. Those are the big ones here in Utah and they're really on the edge um, because they've lost a lot of federal timber. Um, got five out of ten folks uh, uh, participating in the poll. If we have any more, I encourage you to go ahead and make your uh, make your background known there. And also encourage everybody to continue to uh, uh, use the chat pod. Uh, and thank you very much. I mentioned the crop coordinated re resource offering protocol and uh, my co-host Olivia Salmon uh, kindly offered the uh, crop um, Utah Crop website there in the chat pod if you're interested in that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll. Pretty much everybody has participated. And we appreciate your participation there. One of the most challenging parts of um, a timber sale process here in, in Utah is administering the harvest. Um, we have great support here in Utah um, as landowners uh, in forestry, not only the Utah Forest Landowner Education Program that I work with, but um, the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands uh, area foresters are available to you. There's, I think, six area foresters around the state, in, different, in the different regions of the state that are available and a, and a taxpayer benefit to a forest landowner. And their job is to help do direct assistance with forest landowners, essentially to help them through things, <coughs> excuse me, things like the timber sale process. Uh, I think today we have Morgan Mendenhall, area forester from uh, up here in the Bear River area. Um, <clears throat> and welcome Morgan again. Um, and these folks can do lots of great things to help you set up and, and do all the different points of the timber sale, but we'll, they're somewhat limited by their mission um, and how forcefully they're allowed to administer the harvest. That's where you go out on the ground and uh, look at the look at the site on a regular pl basis and uh, work with the logger trying to get them to adhere to the contract and 
and do things that the landowners that landowners want with whether it's within the contract or not just making sure that the landowner is happy and when push comes to shove a uh, division forester like uh, shown on the screen uh, Blaine Hamp who uh, works with Morgan doing the same sort of thing um, on a, on a timber sale up here in Cache County a few years ago, um, they could do great, be great of uh, great help to you, but um, they don't have the contract authority, and they're not allowed to be given the contract authority to shut down the timber sale, uh, to, to shut down the logger and, and tell him he needs to stop logging until it gets drier because there's ret, ruts happening or that he's unhappy with uh, the accounting process of where the wood is going. He, he's not com completely confident that the wood is going to a place where it, it should be going and the right amounts are getting paid for it. And to do that, um, I recommend having a consulting forester hired that you pay for, again, that looks out for your best interest. Um, and. Uh, um, uh, and, and they work with the logger and the division of forester fire and state lands forester and the landowner to get it all done. But uh, an important part of this, you know, this can be the the relationship between logger and landowner and and that and forester. Um, it can be adversarial at times, but I really recommend a, a cooperative approach as much as possible because everybody is going to come out happier in the end and with a good contract there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to have a cooperative approach um, just trying to get along and making sure everybody's seeing eye to eye and communicating well through the process um, uh, an important part of that is the pre-harvest meeting administering the sale um, just going out on the ground before everything starts and having a look around. You know, here we've got we've got two foresters. We've got a consulting forester on the right, a division of forestry, fire and state lands forester, second from the left, a landowner on the left, a um, a, a neighboring landowner with concern uh, in, in between, and a logger, two loggers uh, there on the right, and uh, it's this kind of you know sitting around the standing around the landing or the hood of the pickup and talking about what we want done, how where we gonna where are we gonna want the skid trails, how we're gonna want it to look, what our concerns are, um, is a really important part of the process, a, uh, a pre harvest meeting. And regular site visits by the foresters are really important. Again, here's a photo with a, a logger on the left, a division of forestry, fire, and state lands forester in the middle, and a <coughs> consulting forester uh, on the right, all going out. And this should happen, you know, at least between one of the foresters and the logger, or the landowner and the logger, um, uh, on a regular basis. When they're first starting a timber sale, it, it's appropriate to go perhaps even every day for the first week or two. Make sure that things are getting started in the right foot, on, off on the right foot, and going in the right direction. That uh, uh, the contract's being adhered to. That things are just making sense. They're cutting the right trees, and, and that everybody's happy. And over time, you know, if a timber sale lasts, sometimes it can last several months or even longer. And if that trust is built by after those first few weeks of of repeated visits, um, then it, you know it's often more reasonable to just come up uh, every few days or perhaps even once a week if the logger is not moving that fast. That's a big part of it. If it's a logger with a big crew and they're really running through the property fast, then you need to have really frequent site visits. But if they're moving a little slower, then uh, it's, uh, it reduces the need for such frequency in your site visits. Um, and Again, communication is one of the most important things between the forester and the logger here on the right. A forester is just talking to the logger about the job he's doing and what he expects to be done in the next strip of timber that they come into. And you know, often from one part of the sale to the next part of the sale, maybe one part is marked in leave trees, and you know, the, the trees that are marked you want them to leave. And another part of the sale, and you know, in the back 40, the trees are are marked to take. Those are decisions made by the forester, um, between the forester and the landowner usually, and, uh, and it depends on the, the type of timber resource that's available there. But um, 
it's important things to just make sure everybody is clear on and understands uh, what's going on. Um, I, I don't have a slide for this, but uh, something I should point out is uh, in the administration process is, is the accounting um, part of a timber sale. What we often do is we have uh, we usually have load tickets, we call them, and every load of logs that leaves the landing, um, that leaves the woods, should have a ticket stamped to the back of it, um, right onto the, the bottom log, right behind the driver there, that um, all the way in the back, so that when you're driving by or driving out, you, sh you, sh you can, even if you're just driving by on the highway, you can glance back and see that brightly colored ticket stamped to the logs. You know that they're being ticketed, and it's a two two or three part ticket um, that are available. You can purchase and you rip one portion off and they all have in the same ticket they all have the same corresponding numbers and um, uh, the, some of them stay on the landing uh, usually right in the loader or in the loggers pickup or whatever so that when the forester visits the site you can look at the the tickets and see okay six loads went out today three went to this sawmill north two went to that sawmill south hey but I was coming from the south and there wasn't a ticket on the load that I saw and I know that's your truck and what's going on just making sure everything is uh, copacetic that way and uh, it's one process that we use for uh, ticket books or one process we use for making sure much of the uh, the timber is accounted for as it leaves the property. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your comment, Dale, on uh, welcoming uh, Mr. Daniels, uh, the Energy Policy Coordinator, um, and your comment that uh, uh, biomass energy and, and the smaller uh, material and lower quality material is so important to to what we do here in Utah, and I think that is increasing. It appears to be increasing dramatically with the advent of uh, the power plant in Delta that is required to burn a certain percentage of biomass for them to be allowed to sell their power to their main customer, which is California. Um, they have to mix a certain amount of biomass with their coal, so that is starting to pick up things in that end down in the southern part of the state especially, especially. and I think that's something that uh, we're going to see more of in the future and I think as Dale pointed out it can be to the benefit of the land um, and to the loggers and, and the landowners themselves in many cases to get good work done and, and afford to, to, to pay for it as it comes out of the woods. In the administration process, just wanted to point out, really important uh, when your loggers, uh, kind of the last part of the sale is usually to pile the brush, um, depending on how it was done, and, and uh, brush, my main point here is that brush should be piled with a brush blade, a separate blade from uh, a straight blade uh, you see behind uh, on this cat. and. Uh, the main thing is that a brush blade won't pick up uh, dirt uh, and, and put it into a pile. Here, these loggers are piling with a straight blade, and it, it's impossible not to pick up a bunch of dirt and put it in your pile, and the end result of that is poorly burned piles. And those piles you're a landowner is stuck looking at for decades into the future, unless they uh, bring in another piece of equipment to have that refuse buried or something really important to have good clean piles, tall, stacked really tall so that they burn well and consume all that slash, that leftover material at the end of the process. And uh, one of the keys to getting that done is just having a, uh, a brush blade um, on there. And finally, the last part of the timber sale process is just completing the post-harvest administration and activities. Um, one of the most important parts of that is just water bars. We talked about those a little bit earlier in the program. Uh, this, in this photo you can see in the foreground this, this one that rises up on the skid trail where they had drug skids, uh, skidded logs out of the, out of the woods uh, repeatedly on this little, it's not really a road, we call it a skid trail. But afterwards, you know, on any sloped skid trails, we have uh, uh, them 
put in these water bars with the equipment while it's there is kind of a last thing that they do and uh, this way as soil as uh, water runs down the down the hill uh, as it in inevitably will <coughs> it gets it gets uh, caught by these and filtered off into the vegetation on the side so it doesn't create ruts in these skid trails which is essentially just carrying uh, sediment into the nearby creeks and reducing uh, fish habitat uh, and, and water quality and a big part of closeout as well as I mentioned earlier is um, having um, an appropriate seed mix put on these skid trails. There's some ups and downs to seed mixes. You don't want it everywhere. This grass can be very competitive with trees if you're trying to get regrowth in some places, but on the heavily used skid trails it, it, they should be seeded after the sale. Um, It can be written right into your contract, all slopes uh, above 10% uh, or 15% grade will have uh, water bars installed every so many feet. So uh, water bars are really important part of closeout. And who's going to burn the brush? This is a big one, especially seems like here in Utah it's really hard with a limited amount of value in our logs to uh, build it in such that it's worthwhile for the logger to come back and burn the brush at the end of the sale. Um, here they're winter logging so they're able to burn right right in the middle of the sale without uh, as they're logging they just burn the slash as it comes out of the woods and you can have great results with this especially uh, if you dig a little tr trench or a, um, a hole with the cats uh, to push the brush down into and then just keep burning it as you move through the process uh, all winter or spring that can be effective wouldn't be advisable during the summer to do it this way because of fire danger yeah, same in the fall um, um, but uh, it needs to be clearly lined out who's going to burn the brush. Um, uh, I just can't say enough about how important that can be as far as the long-term visual um, aesthetics of a sale. Um, uh, roads on a timber s on a property lead to the landings because uh, that's, that's where the roads are built to to get the logs out of the woods and so inevitably that's where landowners drive to time and time again and that's where they're going to see that eyesore for uh, decades into the future if, if, if it's not cleaned up right so really important to build it right in the contract I like to have a piece of equipment on site um, when the brush is being burned um, I usually am looking for my timing for burning brushes burning piles is um, uh, after the first inch or so of precipitation in the fall if you get a couple inches of snow on the ground it's a great time to burn often you know say October or something depending on your elevation and the weather and the season um, I encourage folks to consider piling or uh, covering their piles with some plastic um, especially even just over the heart of the pile the middle of the pile then you can get a good uh, sink of heat in the center of the pile and with a piece of equipment there keep pushing it into that sink of heat then you get a complete burn and uh, that piece of equipment can even scratch a little hole and push the final little bones right in there in the end you can't see anything that had been done um, so again burning the brush and uh, the the brush piles is one of the most important parts of uh, uh, landowner satisfaction in the end in my experience uh, closing roads really important either uh, uh, gating roads like this if you're going to want access in the future if you don't want access and you want to re uh, discourage other people from access ATVs and such from illegally accessing the property um, the water bars that I showed we can build them much larger so that they're almost a tank trap we call we used to call them um, but they're even those are pretty difficult to keep ATVs out um, while the equipment is there I recommend putting uh, large uh, rocks if they're available right over the road so they can't get around them between the trees or uh, large uh, large uh, coal uh, trees uh, that did not get sent to the landing that did not get sent to the sawmill often there you know after a tree is cut they discover that it's got rot in it but uh, it's one use for the, these sorts of logs put a pile of logs over the end of the road to prevent uh, uh, folks from coming in and out it can this will help to reduce the erosion on their property by controlling that access often especially motorized access um, will prevent reduce uh, introduction of exotic weeds 
um, and, and other undesirable things in the forest. So closing roads is really important. Kind of reminding myself as I talk about weeds, one thing I often recommend or uh, something for folks to consider is to uh, require loggers to steam clean their equipment before you they bring it onto their your property because whatever weeds were on the previous property they were logging certainly going to be mixed up seeds are going to be mixed up in the undercarriage of the equipment and it's going to be far out in the far reaches of your property and you're going to be stuck with all those weeds and a huge liability in trying to control them perhaps in the future it's a good lick of business often if you're concerned about that just to go ahead <coughs> excuse me go ahead and have them uh, steam clean that equipment before it gets to your property can be built right into the contract costs a little extra in the front but can be worth it in the long run just wanted to finish with the point that uh, it can be done right, you know, with a forester involved and perhaps even two foresters involved, um, a consultant and a division of forestry, fire and state lands for area forester, um, uh, and a concerned logger and, uh, and landowner. Your results can be excellent. Leave trees that are beautiful, a forest that is healthy and vibrant and, and growing and productive and, and will be ready to be harvested again. Uh, in many cases in another 20 years or so providing a more of a perpetual long-term income for you and your family. I uh, wanted to point out some, some other resources to you. Um, this is a video that I produced uh, last year called Considering a Timber Harvest on Your Family Forest. If you are interested in receiving a copy of that it, shoot me an email and with your mailing address and a request for it and I'd be happy to send one to you. It's a 22 minute video that talks about a lot of the things that we talked about here but uh, it's more of a bigger picture look at the whole process to prepare a landowner for what they're getting into. Of course I uh, host timber harvest tours annually um, where we go out with landowners and loggers and look at an active timber sale and that's a great way for a landowner to get a feel for what it's going to look like on their property and to talk to other land other landowners who have gone through it and uh, compare notes and, and prepare yourself for the, for the process. Um, finally in closing just wanted to offer uh, my contact information. Um, of course our website has a ton of information on it. Um, fact sheets. Uh, there's f I think four or five of them at least associated with the timber sale process there on our website. Um, webcasts such as the one um, now and in the future uh, we'll be conducting, uh, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll be having them on this sort of topic. Um, the Utah Forest News offers lots of information on that, so I encourage you to visit our website. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I presented today, whether this, uh, whether you're listening to this live or an archived version, um, I really encourage you to shoot me an email or a phone call or write to me, and I'd be happy to uh, answer questions or discuss things uh, that are going on in your property and. Uh, perhaps even come out for a site visit and have a look and, and uh, give you some ideas on, on, on the process before you get too far into it. And that was all that I had to present.